you've got it. Yeah. Um, and as soon as I've done that, I'll click start. Okay. Yeah, great. Cheers. Thank you. Okay. The and Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to you all to what is our second uh, public session of the Sheffield COVID uh, Prevention and Management Board. Um, and I would also especially like to thank our members of the board um, for joining us today, because I know you all, are all very, very busy people, uh, but also especially for your involvement on the board throughout this period of a pandemic and uh, the city very much appreciate um, your engagement in that. I also want to welcome our viewers. Um, I know there are people out there tuning in uh, just to watch the session, um, but I particularly want to thank those that have subscribed to the session and especially those uh, that are bringing questions uh, to the session. Um, we are oversubscribed. Um, we have a license for around 100 people to join with us in a meeting. Um, so I do apologise uh, to anyone who has tried to subscribe and ask a question and hasn't been able to join us. Uh, but we look forward uh, to you doing that the next time. And so, but you can submit questions uh, to COVID-19 public questions at sheffield.gov.uk. Um, and as I say, we are webcasting live and then you can subsequently further watch and catch up through our council portal. Right, the plan uh, for this afternoon's session, it, it, it is around one and a half hours. Um, there will be an update from our Director of Public Health, Greg Fell, first. Um, and then we're going to take the questions after that. And we do hope we can get through all of the questions and get through as many as possible. If we fail to get through all the questions in that time, we will certainly record them and respond uh, to you uh, via email or in writing. If you don't wish to ask your own question when I read out your name, if uh, we will ask that question on your behalf and read it out. So if I read out your name and you're not in attendance or uh, you don't wish to ask, ask the question yourself, we will do it. Um, we're not able to actually bring you into the room as such. Um, so what we're going to do is just let you speak from the virtual floor so people will hear you, but not like, but they won't be able uh, to see you. Um, there also is a Q&A function that you will be able to see you attendees that have subscribed and you can enter questions on them. We'll be monitoring that and we'll try and introduce those questions. Um, if you do see a question on there that you, um, would particularly like the panel uh, to respond to, you can sort of give it a like or a vote on that thing. So if we see that a particular question has got a lot of interest, then we'll try and make sure uh, that we do, um, we do get round to that. Um, what I'm going to do now, though, is ask all the board members to introduce themselves. So they'll just have a couple of minutes to say who, who they are, uh, who they're representing, um, of course they're representing the whole of the city alongside everyone else, um, but also to just just give a minute or so of why they're here and what what you know what their main uh, real worries or concerns are right now or, or what their particular interest in is at the moment during this period. Um, I have got three apologies of members that are usually members of the board, but unfortunately can't join us today. Um, that's Pauline uh, Camantus from CARE, Alexis from the Chamber, and Catherine uh, Fulton from the College and representing uh, young people. Um, so, uh, but we do have representatives uh, around uh, the board that also represent similar sort of organisations or, or groups or communities. 
So I'm going to take everyone in turn as I see you on the screen. So um, Councillor Douglas Johnson, if you would like to start. Morning there, or afternoon. Um, so as Julie said, I'm Douglas Johnson. I'm a councillor for City Ward, um, and that's basically the city centre plus Kellam Island plus Highfield. And I'm a representative for the Green Party on this board. And just a short description of what we've been doing over the lockdown and response to coronavirus has been lots and lots of casework and uh, talking to people and troubleshooting and all the sort of stuff that councillors do a lot of the time anyway. But just with different ways of working, so being very flexible in the way that people contact us and in which way we contact them. I think that's all I need to say to keep it short. Thank you. Thank you very much, Douglas. Uh, councillor Shafak Mohammed. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Shafak Mohammed. I'm a city councillor for the Ecclesaw Ward, um, the leader of the Liberal Democrats on Sheffield Council, so the opposition leader. Um, my kind of issues have been, well, concerns have really been around young people, uh, in particular uh, the return to school, but also now uh, with the university students being back, and in particular the increasing rates of infections that we've seen within, not just in Sheffield, but across the country in our young people, but also the dangers of the disease being taken back into households, because that is the real concern we all have uh, on the COVID-19 outbreak control board here in Sheffield around household infections. So they have been my main uh, areas of concern. And I, I don't think they're unique to me. I think the entire board is in agreement with those. So I'll leave it at that, Chair. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Shafak. Uh, absolutely right to say that. Um, Patrick Melide, Patrick. Good afternoon, my name's Patrick Malidi. I currently manage Pittsburgh Adventure Playground and work in Sharrow, at Sharrow Community Forum. Um, throughout the lockdown, I've been busy working to support food banks and food collections and delivering uh, play packs and art packs and sports equipment across the city. So I've been out and about and viewing firsthand some of the challenges we face. Very concerned and worried about the government messaging and the confusion and the conflicts it's creating for us locally. Uh, I'm really eager to see how we can support children and young people and the families because I run an adventure playground uh, and I, I'm one of the community representatives on the board. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, Gulnaz? Um, mute, Gulnaz. Oh, sorry. About Thank that. you. No, oh, it's fine. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Uh, um, yeah, my name is Gulnaz Hussain, and I'm the Chief Executive of the Fairvale Community um, uh, Hub, based in Fairvale in, Bangry, in the Burn Grief Ward. It's a grassroots organisation, and we've been working really hard connecting the strategic, the enhanced, which is the citywide approach on um, um, COVID-19 and the grassroots work. And my, prim my main and primary concern is those who are vulnerable, those who are suffering from mental health problems, women, BME women, people who can't help, whose language is not English, um, the elderly, um, and the significant impact of reduction of um, services provided by community facilities. So with, with COVID kicking in, we've had to kind of reduce what we offer significantly. And I think this is having a huge impact in bringing communities together and being part of society and people are kind of feeling extremely lonely. So for me, that's having a major impact in terms of down on the ground in the grassroots. Um, my role on the board has been um, putting my efforts into bringing and bridging the gap between what, what people in senior level within the council are saying to people right down on the ground. And I've tried to do my best in terms of connecting that message both ways, bring what their feelings are to this board and take what they're saying on this board back down into communities and act in the appropriate way we possibly could. And thank you. Um, thank you, Ogul Naz. And on that last point, just to say you certainly have been doing that and we thank you for it too. Steve? Thank you, uh, Julie. I'm Steve Chu. I'm the Chief Executive of Age UK Sheffield, the over 50s charity. Um, during the lockdown, we uh, supported many older people through uh, food, medication and uh, addressing social uh, isolation issues. Um, and obviously bringing older people's perspective uh, to this board, uh, particularly um, interested obviously in the city's um, protection of people uh, in care homes and those living in the community. 
thank you, Steve. And as someone over 50, thank you very much personally for representing me. <laughs> Emily. Hi, I'm uh, Emily. I'm Chief Executive of Disability Sheffield. We're a disabled people's uh, user-led organisation in the city. Um, and during uh, lockdown, we've very much been um, supporting disabled people, particularly around health and social care issues. Um, and on a really practical basis, we've been delivering um, PPE to people who employ their own um, PAs who can't get it from anywhere else. So that's been a really successful and just making sure that people have got um, their care and support in, in place. Um, in terms of, I guess, following on from, from Golders and Steve, our real concerns are around those people that are particularly um, at high risk if, if they catch, catch COVID and just a real concern around um, with the finishing of shielding. There's an awful lot of people that are still really, really anxious, um, really worried, um, that are getting increasingly isolated at home and it's how we, how we support them, how we make sure that those people that need care and support are still managing to get, get what they need and how, we, how that's in place in different ways. Um, and we're also really concerned about discrimination. So we are picking up from um, disabled people. When we're talking disabled people, I'm talking sort of pan disability. So it could be physical disability, could be a long-term impairment, could be mental health issue, learned disabilities, autism. People are, are getting increasing discrimination when they're going out and about. Um, so for example, um, the importance of wearing face coverings, but for those that, that can't um, and some of the difficulties they're getting and are getting excluded from being able to, to use services and it's how we um, support those, those people and, and are really conscious in terms of that longer term impact on people. Um, thank you, Emily. And as I just mentioned to Steve, on your last point, um, as someone with an adult child with a learning disability uh, and a, as a carer, I, I do want to thank you for all the all the work you're doing and you know personally benefited from it so thank you for that joe thanks judy um good afternoon everybody i'm joe rennie i'm a group director for student and academic services at sheffield hallam university um, i'm one of the senior staff at um, at the university that have been charged with leading um our response to the pandemic since since march of this year um, our work has been largely focused on finishing the previous year well for our students um, and in preparing for this coming year and with a particular focus actually on the couple of the period we're in now with the arrival of students for welcome week and with the start of teaching um, from Monday. I'm not going to try and distill um, what's been an extraordinary six months of work into a couple of minutes. I think you'll all be pleased to hear that but I would like to pull out a couple of points about um, the things we've done on campus are the things you would expect in terms of the physical makeup of, of our settings and the things you're now familiar with in, in the settings that you operate in, um, but also the fact that we've radically rethought how we actually deliver our, our teaching. So large lectures um, are now being delivered online. Students will be on campus for fewer hours a week, and that will be based around seminar and practical work, smaller group activities. Um, Throughout, we've been working in partnership with colleagues at the City Council, and that's why I'm here today, um, to make sure that we're aligned in what we're doing, to make sure that um, we're following the right guidance if we get cases of COVID in our community, um, and about the behaviour of students in, in the wider Sheffield community too. So that partnership working is why I'm here today, and I'm really looking forward to being part of the discussion. Thank you, Joe. It is a very live issue, isn't it? The return of universities. So very well timed, I think, the session today. Um, Susan? Thank you, Julie. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Susan Bridgeford, and I'm representing Sheffield University. Um, my role is very similar to Joe's, uh, who you've just heard from. Um, so in common with Sheffield Hallam University, we've been working hard on this issue all year in terms of how we look after students, how we have transferred uh, teaching online for the second semester and getting ready for the return, the safe return of students to start their teaching programmes this Monday, um, as Joe has described as well. So lots of work around campus um, to put in place all the measures that we, we now are familiar with, social distancing, hygiene measures, one-way flows and so on. Um, and I also have um, a range of services such as our university health service, our mental health service for students as well, 
and we're making sure that those services are geared up to support students with um, any problems that they face uh, from now on um, at university. So very similar to Joel's remit, we're also concerned with student behaviours and students being good neighbours. Um, and we, work, we have worked very closely with the City Council and local public health. We're very grateful for those relationships to make sure that our protocols are appropriate and that we know what we're going to do um, if we get positive cases, how we work well with the, with the council and how we look after students in those circumstances. Thank you. Um, thank you, Susan. As we always say, students are so extremely important to our city and we welcome each and every one of them to our great city of Sheffield. And despite what's happening, we still do hope they very much enjoy their experience here in Sheffield. I certainly know that universities are doing everything they can and the city uh, does also, so thank you. Louise. Good afternoon. Um, so I am a director to the Sheffield Chamber of Commerce, which is a membership organisation that represents businesses across all sectors in the city. Um, I'm also uh, the co-chair of the, the uh, City Growth Board, which is the private sector uh, board that works with the council for, uh, to help develop economic growth plans for Sheffield um, and Sheffield Business Together, which is a consortium of private sector businesses that work with charities and voluntary organisations to try and um, harness the private sector to tackle sort of key social issues in Sheffield. Um, I suppose the key things that I'm hearing that people are concerned about, businesses concerned about how to keep employees safe at work, how they balance home working with the need for interaction to ensure people have you know um uh, good mental health uh, they're concerned about downturning revenues and cash flow and how they can keep jobs safe um with sheffield business together we focused on the immediate need so that the private sector managed to raise around ninety thousand pounds for the food bank network in sheffield but there's concerns with the charities that we work with about how they remain viable when they've lost uh, their source of fundraising income they can't run events um, I'm also a trustee at St Luke's Hospice, actually, and that's a real challenge for us. Um, and um, a lot of the charity and voluntary sectors that we support are um, concerned about the increasing demand for their services at a time when they're losing revenues. Um, so, yes, similar to everybody else, I'm very grateful to Sheffield City Council for pulling this board together. It's fantastic to see so many different organisations represented, being able to receive information and then impart that information to the people in our networks has been really useful. So thank you. And, and uh, businesses now are facing extremely uncertain, you know, times, aren't they? And uh, and again, it is a very live, live issue, especially with the most recent announcement. So thank you, Louisa. And you represent others, as you've said, sitting on uh, a board of a hospice as well. Um, we're all interconnected and interdependent of each other. Um, Shahida. Thank you, Julie. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sheila Sadiq. I'm the Chief Executive for an organisation called Faith Star, but I'm also the city's lead for Bain communities and faith communities. My role really in the city during the pandemic has been to advocate and connect and re-establish relationships between institutions and Bain communities in terms of responding to COVID, whether that's strategically, operationally or tactically uh, uh, at a grassroots level. Um, and from a faith community's perspective, it's really about being supporting places of worship to support their congregations and their faith communities to not only deal with um, the pandemic, but also the impact of the pandemic in terms of bereavements and burials and pastoral care. So um, two really quite intense areas, but ultimately it's been about connecting them across the city institutions and, and making sure that across sectors people are working where the need to where the need is greatest for the most vulnerable across the city i think the things that are keeping me up at night at the moment is we're heading into the winter flu season and christmas and just what that might mean for our faith communities but also fears around the disproportionate impact on BAME communities with the pandemic as the numbers start to rise we saw what it was like at the beginning and just worries about that it could come again mm -hmm. to some of our most vulnerable communities uh, yeah, thank you, Shahida. I think, again, uh, we're all very, very concerned about that and very wary of it. And it's something that this board will be constantly uh, monitoring and your input and Gulnaz's input in particular and everyone else um, is really critical to ensuring that, that whilst we're wary of that, we need to make sure that 
they don't continue to be disproportion disproportionately affected by it. So thank you. Uh, finally, Councillor Jackie Drayton. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, afternoon, everybody. Yes, I, I'm Councillor Jackie Drayton. I'm um, a, a councillor for Burn Grieve Ward, which is where I live, and I'm the cabinet member for children, young people and families um, and some of my portfolio uh, responsibilities include all age disabilities and public health. Um, I suppose just echoing, I would echo everything on the on the panel has already said, but for me, I suppose my concerns are that tension between keeping our city open and keeping the economy going and at the same time keeping our citizens as safe as we possibly can. I think that's there's a tension in that, and I think we need to make sure we do both. I'm really concerned about uh, poverty growing with um, unemployment and the things that you know if businesses fail in across the picture. I'm also um, I'm also conscious that um, as somebody who was on the shielded list, you know people on the shielded list still feel I think very vulnerable, and I know there's some questions uh, around that. So I think that it's important we look after the most vulnerable, not just those on the shielded list, but as already been said, there's vulnerable people across the across our uh, across our city. Um, I also think it's really important and um, uh, that that support that people have for their emotional and mental health and well-being and that's an area where we've seen in the past like we've seen throughout this pandemic our um, voluntary community and faith sector organizations or across our city and local people coming together to try and try and help and support each other um, but in the past, we've seen those organisations do social cafes, do all those to keep that connection between people and to keep them, their morale up. And I'm really concerned that with the that we're going, as people have said, we're going now into the next pandemic, the next the next uh, uh, phase, and it's going to get worse with seasonal flu and everything. That we're locking down again, and if we're not careful, we'll we, you know those people will lose that sense of being part of a community, which they are. And uh, it, it's just, I think, as, as, as again, I think it's great to be on this board and to hear what everybody else is doing and to know as a city, I think we are working together to try and do the best. And I just like to finish off by saying, don't forget, wash your hands, keep safe space between you and isolate if you get sick symptoms. Yes, sorry. And sing the Peppa Pig song now <laughs> when washing hands. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Uh, right. Thank you for that. Ju uh, just just before I bring uh, Greg in, then ju just from myself, uh, I remember right at the start when we had to um, set out a strategy for, for Sheffield of how we're going to cope with this, not just with the virus itself and the transmission of it, etc., um, but also about the implications of it and the lockdown. Um, uh, we set out sort of five, just very simply, a strategy with five key points, which was keep people safe, um, protect the vulnerable, and recognising that at any one time, every one of us could become in that vulnerable category. We can identify quite clearly early on who the vulnerable people are. But during this process, uh, uh, this pandemic, any one of us in our city could become in a vulnerable category. So it's to protect those. Uh, return to work and education as soon as it's safe to do so. Um, follow government guidance um, and advice. But our job is to then help our citizens understand what that guidance is and that advice is, and then therefore to help them make those diffi difficult decisions that they're facing, following on from that. And finally, keeping our economy going and open, because we talk about saving lives, but we, all, we also have to save livelihoods because we know the impact on livelihoods can be just as harmful as people's personal and physical uh, harm from a virus um, so so it was both and we followed that strategy all the way through and it's it it works for us so I want to thank everyone for playing the part in all that right so I'm now going to hand over to Greg and he's going to do his presentation and then we'll move into questions
Greg, over to you. Um, thanks, Julie. Um, so, uh, so hopefully I won't need any introduction. I think most people know me. Most people certainly recognize me wallpaper. Um, there's, um, um, I'm going to do a presentation of probably about 10 slides, 15 minutes there or thereabouts. Um, all of this stuff, I'll, I'll make sure that for those that want it, the, the, the slides can be circulated. Um, all, all of it's very freely available. So um, let me uh, do the screen share first. Um, screen share. There, right. Okay. Um, slide show. So, uh, situation report as of today. Um, it's up to date as of today. Um, it may change tomorrow. It may change the day after. It will certainly change the week after. Um, I'm Greg Fell, Director of Public Health. I'm contactable by various various means. Uh, I even have a phone number, but I'm not giving that one out. Um, uh, but you can contact me by various means. Uh, three things I'll talk about. One, current epidemiology, up to date today. Two, um, our arrangements to manage the pandemic. And three, um, and this is from me as DPH, the hot issues, the worry list, and the core messages. Um, to cut to the chase, the core messages, sadly, are very, very, very unchanging. Um, uh, so you know what I'm going to say right at the very end, so I'll give you a full warning on that one. Firstly, epidemiology, getting hotter. Um, getting hotter in Sheffield is getting hotter in the country. Um, I'll skip through the slides. This was a picture of the epidemiology, the rate per hundred rate of COVID-19 cases. So those with symptoms who have a positive test, um, all routes of testing um, 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 for the whole country um, for the last four or five weeks. This, this week 35 was about four weeks ago. Uh, the geographically challenged amongst you, Sheffield is there. Um, not, not half as um, uh, hot as West Yorkshire, which is north of us, Greater Manchester, um, which is there. That's about four weeks ago. Uh, and if you, if you do, as I've said this before, I'll say again, if you want one place to look for national epidemiology, it's this link at the bottom, the, the weekly Public Health England surveillance report. It's published every Friday. It's very, very good. Um, it's quite long, it's quite dorky. Um, people like me pour over it in great detail. Um, but if you do want one place to look, then that would be the one place I would recommend. Three weeks ago, um, you can see it's getting a bit hotter. Um, Sheffield is fairly constant, actually. Um, but you can see parts of the south of England beginning to increase in rate. I encourage you to watch the northeast of England. Two weeks ago, you can see the country is getting um, a redder, turning largely to uh, orange. Uh, London is hotting up, which is which is uh, which um, it was um, a surprise that it took so long. Sheffield remains largely the same colour. Um, you can see what's happening in most of the northwest. The northeast is actually taking off as well. Um, I think, yeah, this is last week. No, this is this week. This is this week's published today. Um, same picture. Sheffield is at Sheffield and Rotherham, which is our next door neighbour, is quite hot. The northeast has really taken off, um, uh, as, uh, uh, as was um, Riley characterised to me on the meeting um, of, a, of a, a few hours ago when we were talking about the epidemiology in South Yorkshire. Um, some, someone cutely put, at least it's not the northwest or the northeast. The rates up there are much, much, much higher than they are here. And the, the, there's some important ramifications of that, which I'll come on to. So that's the national picture. Um, this is the Sheffield picture. Um, um, this, is, this, this graph shows the, um, the um, seven day rolling incidence. So the number of cases diagnosed per 100,000 people over a seven day period. Um, um, and we use seven day because it just smooths out the bumpiness. If you do it day to day, it will say a very, very bumpy graph. So we use seven days to, 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 uh, to iron out the difference. This was about 10 days ago. Uh, nine, well, it's more than 10 days ago, but the last data point we had, it was 9th, 9th of September. Um, 31 per 100,000 incidents, it's been fluctuating. You can see the, um, you can see the pattern uh, at the start it was a very high peak. Um, you will, and I'll point this out. The, the, the lighter red is pillar one. So that was people poorly enough to be in hospital. Um, and as the number of people um, diagnosed per day um, in hospital. Um, the darker red is pillar two, everybody, the whole population testing, which wasn't really available to us for a range of reasons early on in the pandemic. So um, from the peak, which was around here, April, May, early June, Numbers have gone down and down and down. They were fluctuating up and down. You can see here, lockdown was eased there. Um, no real change, fluctuating up and down. I had a minor panic here, 
when rates started to look they were like they were going up and then they fluctuated back down. So that's the story up until about 10 days, 10 days ago, 15 days ago. Um, I'll update that story. That's what's happened since. So this was the data up to the 19th of September, which is the last I've got very, very, very reliable data for. Um, we're now on, uh, it's, it's, it's moved up from 50, actually it's closer to 55 per 100,000 seven day rolling instance. That's in a week. Um, so um, the, the um, positivity, uh, i.e. the proportion of people who have symptoms, get a test and test positive, that's the positivity, is now 4%. Um, it was about 2%, it's now 4%. Um, so the two implications of that, it, it's rising. Um, secondly, of 100 people with symptoms who think they have this illness, 96 of them do not have this illness. Um, so that's an important um, point. It's doubling about weekly. So Chief Medical Chief Scientific Officer told, told you all on um, Monday, it's doubling weekly, it's doubling weekly here as well. Um, until relatively recently, hospital activity, i.e. the proportion of people who were hospitalised, was very low to negligible. That is not now the case. Um, it's still low, um, um, but, but, but it, it is there um, and a discernible rise. Um, not so much here as has happened in other parts of Yorkshire and other parts of Northern England, where there is very definitely discernible hospital activity. You look at the graph and there's a, there's a distinct rise. We're, we're early in that phase, but we can't stop that. Now that, that's, that, that is set in. So, um, so whilst um, at the moment, we are mainly counting cases, people who have a positive test, not illness, people who have a positive test and are actually quite poorly, and that's an important balance, that will not remain. Um, we will get back into the business of counting illness. Um, the age profile has shifted significantly over the course of the pandemic. Two, gra two graphs on this chart, one, one of which is the mean age of a positive test, a person with a positive test as opposed to a positive test, um, which early on was in the 60s. So the average age of a, of a case was in the 60s. Hospital activity reflected that. So you will remember early on, um, earlier in summer, Hospitals were really quite full. Um, now, um, this is a few weeks old, this data now, this is about three or four weeks old. Um, mean age was about 35. Um, it's come right down. So I'll take you back to that point about counting cases versus counting illness. Illness is usually older people who have pre-existing vulnerabilities, medical vulnerabilities of one type or another, with one exception. Long COVID um, is a phenomenon that's becoming um, I, I wouldn't say it's becoming common, but more and more is becoming understood about long COVID. And there are some young people with very mild illness first time round that are developing this syndrome called long COVID, which is proving to be very, really quite debilitating. So the young people who think they're all immune, um, most of them probably are. Most of them will probably have a fairly mild illness, but some of them will not. Um, and I'd encourage you to uh, talk to somebody with long COVID to, to ask them how it's changed their life fundamentally. Um, so that's the mean age of the graph. The, this is the, the worry bit. Um, and one of my jobs is to worry you all, and I apologize for that. Um, week by week, read the graph like this. This was week 28, week 29, and, you know, so 5th, 5th of July, 19th of July, 26th of July. Uh, so the columns indicate weeks. Um, mostly cases in sort of youngish working age people. But the bit I want to draw your attention to is here. It's beginning to show, and I, I didn't, I'd ignore the last column, week 38, because it's not complete data-wise. This is worrying me, significantly worrying me. This is beginning to, to of shifting the, um, the um, cases back up into older age groups. That's significant, that's happening nationally, it's certainly happening locally. Um, and as I say, not yet seen significant illness that's come from that, but that seems inevitable, sadly. Um, it's a concept known as stacking. I'll use one epidemiological term today, and it's called stacking. Um, if I live in a household, it's easy for me to pass that illness to other people in my household. And eventually, if there are older people in that household, that's when we get this phenomenon called stacking. So that is happening. Um, um, not, not yet enough to be worrying, but it is happening and it's probably unstoppable. It's shifting. The geography is shifting. Um, uh, uh, this is uh, August 20th, so late August. Um, reasonably widespread transmission, but, but if I'd looked earlier than this, the transmission would have been here in uh, the Arthur wards around the east of the city centre. Uh, this is more recent. 
Um, and you can see there's a big takeoff in down door and Totley, uh, and there's fairly widespread community transmission in each of the, these are lower super output areas, which is a fairly small unit of geography, uh, fairly widespread across the whole of the city, actually. Uh, in each LSOA, relatively small number of people, but aggregated together, it, come, it, becomes, it becomes quite significant. Um, so um, they're, they're probably enough pretty pictures, some words. Um, the, the, the epidemiology, principally driven by household clusters, one or two setting-based outbreaks, schools and workplaces, et cetera, but not many, principally household clusters. Um, the ethnicity has shifted. If you'd asked me about ethnicity a month ago, um, predominantly Asian population, that is not now the case. Um, it's much, much more representative of the Sheffield population. Not quite wholly representative, but, but certainly much, much, much more. Um, much more. Um, the mean age is lower, um, and that, that may go back up. Um, so pro probably reduced exposure in older people who by and large are taking a lot more care and more mixing in, young, in, young, in younger people. Um, the trend at the moment is, is, is currently on the back of young people returning to the things that young people do, coming back from holidays, house parties. It's probably important for me to say two, two things. One, there's no single cause, an explanatory reason, other than um, it's kind of people wanting to get back to normal. And secondly, um, I'm definitely, definitely not victimizing young people here and there's, there's there's a lot of quite difficult narrative of this is all students fault no no it's not this is just what happens um when 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 people do what do do what they do so uh, uh the, the, the th i'll come back onto that right at the very end um my concerns we've definitely seen a sustained rise in cases last 14 days mainly single cases very much across sheffield um, and significantly driven by some household clusters in the south and southwest of the city um We've not yet got anywhere like exponential growth, um, but that may come. Um, um, you saw what Chief Medical Chief Scientific Chief Scientific Officer said on uh, uh, Monday. Um, it is beginning to move up the age groups. Um, testing is a um, testing problem for us. It's a national problem. It's not not within my control. So please don't grumble at me. I'd encourage you to grumble at Dido Harding, who is in charge of the National Test and Trace Program. Um, um, some of the, the, the problem is capacity within the, uh, the, the lab capacity within the national system um, and, and access to testing is very problematic as many, many watching will know to their cost. Um, it does also have ramifications in terms of isolation of those with symptoms. You remember of 100 people with symptoms, the um, advice is isolate and get a test. If you can't get a test, that's 100 people, not four, who are going to be isolating. So that's a significant problem. Um, and um, contact tracing, if we, it's very, very difficult to contact trace 100 people. It's relatively easy to contact trace the contacts of four people. Um, also, testing access makes our epidemiology a bit more suspect uh, because the, all of the epidemiology has been built on testing. Um, hospital activity, we've seen a small but certainly not trivial increase um, and deaths. We've begun to see deaths, um, the COVID, COVID marked on death certificates again, following a long period of zero deaths. Um, uh, very worrying, and it is a, certainly a concern for me and a concern for many others. Um, strategy, um, the, the Council of Doors set out the strategy. So the, 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 the broad thing, the broad aims of the strategy there at the, uh, at the bottom, um, keep people safe, protect the vulnerable, reopen Sheffield, follow government advice. Um, um, and we've followed that throughout, actually, and it still broadly stands. Um, is, is overseen essentially by this board of people, the Coronavirus Prevention Management Board, we're very helpfully steering that through. Um, um, what we're trying to do here is minimize harm. The, the direct harm of a dangerous respiratory virus that, as you have all seen, is very easily transmissible and has 1% mortality. That is not trivial um, in any way, shape or form. Equally, um, blunt tools to reduce the impact of the virus directly, aka lockdown, and I do, do not like that term, but I'll use it, um, use it now, that also carries social and economic harm that we equally want to avoid as a city and as a country. This is just a city thing. Um, so we're trying to balance those two things is, uh, is, is difficult. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. Um, Invariably, there's a plan. Um, the, the plan is the, the, the link, the, one of the two links at the bottom of the page. Um, the, the plan is, sets out how we do that, both using soft intelligence um, of all types and flavors and all sorts of snippets of information to reach our inboxes um, and reach our ears well before they get turned into data, which people in my team turn into pretty graphs and charts. 
Um, um, the, both matter, both matter a lot. Um, testing capacity, um, I think will come up in questions, but it's a problem. Contact tracing will come up in questions. I can't, we, we have, we are working, uh, we are um, testing tracing is operating. Um, it's not operating half as well as it should be. And we're we are establishing um, something to, uh, to enhance local, uh, the, the local arm of contact tracing. Um, support for those who are self-isolating. Um, um, uh, it's easy for me to self-isolate. I'm just working in my bedroom for another fortnight. Um, but, it, but if my income is very much dependent on me being at work, then that becomes much, much harder. Comms and engagement, uh, formal big C comms, but, but, but engagement of all sorts of descriptions. Um, as a city, we've provided a huge amount of support to various settings, care homes, schools, workplaces, universities, I could go on, um, both prevention and response, um, looking at high risk places and communities and vulnerable people. The second link, for those of you that want it, is the, is the, uh, so the, 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 the paper that was taken to the council cabinet on Wednesday, which sets out the, um, the details of the operational plan in, in, in great detail, and you can pour over that at your leisure. Nearly done. In a few months, I think the strategy remains right. I can see no reason to change that. Um, I think the balance of things that we are trying to get right remains uh, broadly about right. Um, and we won't get that right all of the time. There's no doubts about that. We're not yet seeing exponential growth. I think we're not yet into wave two. We are seeing a creep of the illness into more vulnerable groups. That I think is a rising tide rather than a tidal wave. Um, I do think we stick with the plan. Um, um, there's a there's a tricky conversation that is being had nationally about um, that there's there's appetite for enforcement and the law. Um, uh, it's difficult to enforce the law when the phenomenon applies to 580,000 people. Um, so there is something about the balance of enforcing the law and the powers versus the social consensus and what Sheffield as a city is trying to do. Um, we are intensifying our efforts across lots of different spaces, prevention, management, outbreak, comms, contact tracing, et cetera, and, and we can dwell on those during questions. Um, up, upcoming stuff, um, um, m m m many of them, so bonfire nights, Christmas fairs, don't let it be said that Greg Fell wants to cancel Christmas because he doesn't, but Christmas is a big concern um, because um, the, you know, it is the mass movement of, of, of millions of people across the country we all go and visit our gran, etc. So, uh, so those kinds of things do concern me, and sorry to have to say it. Um, so, my ten issues. Um, it's not all over. Um, I, I hope I hope that message has landed. Um, household transmission is key. All of the evidence says that, that households are where transmission is is uh, is occurring. So, our measures and our efforts must focus there. Balancing the the economic and social harm versus the clinical harm. Balancing cases versus illness. Testing capacity, I've talked about three times, I shan't talk about again. Improving our contact tracing and isolation. Currently, 73% of all cases and contacts are found um, and identified and given advice. Not quickly enough, um, and that 73% isn't enough. So we are working to improve that and supporting isolation. Schools, universities are high volume work for my team, but not terribly high risk. And to, be, to the credit of the university, both the universities, the college, and all of our schools, they have worked immensely hard um, uh, over the last couple of months to make those environments as safe as possible. No one can give any guarantees that they are absolutely safe. There's no such thing as zero risk, um, but, but they've worked damn hard and, and credit to them. Um, Protecting the vulnerable um, uh, is, is priority number one. It goes back to our strategy, protect the vulnerable. Um, shielding may come back. Um, and one of the questions that has picked up on that, so we may come back to that. Care home residents, those in domiciliary care, those in hospital beds becomes really important. Um, intervention fatigue, who's not bored of this now? Who doesn't want this to be over? I certainly want it to be over. So, um, so sticking with the program is gonna be um, um, a, a, a difficult thing. Um, over complex guidance versus basic principles. And I'll, I'll dwell on that last. Like ho hoaxes. Um, there are lots of them. There was a hoax a few weeks ago that um, we we would forcibly test your children and detain them and put them into care if they tested positive. It, it was just a hoax. It was wrong. Um, it was actually repugnant. Um, um, the, 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 there's the, this, the whole thing is a hoax or a conspiracy theory. Well, that is not true either. So, but there's a lot of hoaxes around and please let me know when you find hoaxes because we like to dispel them. The Prime Minister's announcements, I won't dwell because you can do those yourself. Lastly, um, 
the, because of the Prime Minister's announcement, um, there were a hundred pages of new guidance. I've read about 10 of them. Um, the core messages through all of them are constant. Um, in order of impact, if you have symptoms, get a test, stay at home, uh, isolate, give details of your contacts and seek help medical if needed. The more contact we have with other people, the more opportunities there are for the virus to amplify and spread and accelerate into new groups. Stay at home if you're a contact, wash your hands, keep your distance, wear a face covering. All of those things matter collectively. So um, I think I, I do stop there. Yes, so I shall uh, stop there and uh, hand back over to Julie. Right, th thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. And as I will say to our viewers, if, if anyone wishes to have sight of um, the presentation or, or any of the um, graphs or uh, maps, etc., uh, I'm sure we can, uh, we can send them on. So if you get in touch with us, uh, then we can send you some of the slides um, that you are expressing interest in or all of the uh, presentation. Right, I'm going to move on to questions now, but I, I have got a couple of questions that Shahida has indicated that she would like to give a quick response to. Um, so I'm going to let Shahida come in. I think there's certainly one from Sheffield Local Carols, Jill and Assist. So Shahida, would you like to um, just respond just to a couple of those? i.e. reaching out to those yeah, um, uh, people and organisations. Th thank you, Julie. Just in regards to um, assist, um, I think we had a question from Andrew Mance. Um, just very concerned about um, the possibility of accommodation for asylum seekers um, and evictions and the impact that this will have on BAME community organisations having to pick up, this particularly around homelessness, um, for that cohort of people. Just to say, uh, we are already in touch with um, ASSIST, but this was raised with us yesterday and we will be getting in touch with them to explore where we can get some additional support and find out what the needs are around that particular cohort. So just to let you know, we are already reaching out and we are aware of the situation. We're just going to start to explore what the potential implications are for the city on that one and then hopefully we can give you an update at the next but we will reach out to assist directly and, and but they have already reached out to us on that one um for the sheffield local carolers um i'd like to invite them to the sheffield faith and covid um so the sheffield faith and public health uh, meeting that's on wednesday so if dan if you can get um jill hughes contact details for us um, there is quite a little, uh, quite a lot. We've had this question come up a number of times from places of worship in terms of carol singing and what they can do outside um, and taking safety measures to be able to do that. We know that the circumstances are quite unique to each group and each place of worship and, and maybe just talking through some of the circumstances and details on that as well. So um, we'll certainly reach out to Jill and give her as much support on that as well so they can do that safely and in the most appropriate way as possible obviously bearing in mind the current guidelines as well and then just really the last question i think there was was from jill acres on um the legality of holding face-to-face -face committee meetings for charitable organizations where there's more than six participants um the first thing i'd say to you jill on that one is uh, check your um charitable insurance it has to be obviously COVID-19 ready in terms of the physical space. Um, and there is advice and guidance from the Charity Commission on that. And I'd also suggest you get in touch with Voluntary Action Sheffield for additional support and guidance on that. But um, there are ways around it. Our recommendation would be if you, if you, it's better to meet via Zoom. I know that's difficult for some people, uh, but if you do have to meet face-to-face, -face, try and keep it to the group rule of six. Um, and find ways around how to do that, but certainly get some get some support before you do that. And I'd, I'd recommend you go to Voluntary Action Sheffield for that additional support uh, advice on the charitable committee meetings if you need to. I think that's it, Julie. No, thank, thank you very much, Shahida. Uh, right, so I'm going to start with um, Margaret. Margaret Hill, who is asking a question about council services. Margaret? Julie just had a message from Zoom saying that unfortunately Margaret's <coughs> using an older version of the software that doesn't allow her to um, okay. the function to work. So could someone read her 
question out yeah. on her behalf? I'll just basically say it's around um, some of the community buildings that we have. Um, some are managed by the council and some are, of course, probably managed by others. Um, and then she asks a question about um, tenants association, uh, connecting with tenants, i.e. via some of these venues that they used to. Um, but also she's raised a specific issue about um, a couple of tenants uh, repairs issues, which I would ask Margaret if she could send through an email um, giving us the details of both of those, certainly the one regarding the gas, um, the gas inspection, etc. Um, and then we'll follow those up individually. Um, but re regarding the community uh, buildings, I do know that the IMG, the Incident Management Group, are looking at that at this very moment, because of course we want to be opening up our community centres. I don't know if Greg is who attends the IMG knows any more about those particular ones, Sorby, House, Burngreen, Vestry Hall and Verdon Street. Um, the, the, no, I don't. I don't attend the IMG much as I wish to. I never, never oh, actually okay. made it. So I'll, in, I'll ensure there's a written answer. Okay, that's probably the only meeting you don't intend uh, attend. But anyway, yeah, well, as I say, I do know that they are considering it and we're looking at the different uh, community buildings. And of course, particularly the ones that are managed by the council because we're in control of those. But where there are others, we work with the uh, providers of those buildings uh, and management of those buildings to advise and guide. Uh, so we'll get a, a response on that one. Um, right, the next questions are around school. So I've got Kate Armstrong first. Uh, Kate isn't in the attendees list, Julie, really, I'm afraid. Okay. Well, kids. I'll bring Brendan in. Brendan Lawrence is Brendan around. There, there's similar questions around schools and um, the um, sort of uh, guidance that's given to schools and how we're protecting the staff and the children in school. So oh, is Brendan yeah, around? I'll bring Brendan in now. Brendan should now be... Okay, can you uh, hear me? Yes, Brendan, off you go. Okay, thank you. So I've got three questions around schools. I want to make it clear that I'm not criticising schools because I know they have a very difficult job. Um, but my son has some worrying anecdotes about crowded corridors, um, you know, and about half the people in that corridor having no masks on. He has anecdotes about the transfer bus that they use between school sites being absolutely crowded. And again, um, you know, very um, low compliance with wearing masks and so on. Um, so I'm just a little worried that, you know, the schools have their plans, but the actual enforcement of those plans may be falling down in some areas. Now, I know it's difficult for them. I do appreciate, um, that they can't be everywhere at once and they have limited staff resources but uh, actually with the way the trends are going in terms of um, the virus I, I find that quite worrying um, there was also I had a question around um, I mean the Prime Minister himself I think has tried to assure people that um, uh, school children are not as susceptible to catching and shedding the virus as as adults are but you know when you start to look at the older groups between say years y9 to 13 and look at what's happening in universities now at the moment as well. Uh, I find it hard to believe that there isn't a risk there, to be perfectly honest. And even though young people themselves may suffer milder cases, and that doesn't apply to all of them, of course, um, there is very much a risk of them bringing the virus home uh, to other older, more vulnerable members of their families. Um, and my final question related to schools was really around what options are available to parents who are trying to protect a whole family in these circumstances and who find that the risk of sending a child to school, um, particularly with the way trends are going, is becoming unacceptable. Uh, can we insist on home learning or online learning for our children or can we make other arrangements? Um, you know, if that's the decision that we take as the best way to protect our families. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Greg, would you like to start off? I thought you might. Thank you. <laughs> um, so in short, I'll try and be quick. 
um, 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 uh, being rules being enforced. Um, the, so schools of school, schools, um, the education sector, but schools. The question was about schools have made hu huge efforts, and the, for schools themselves have made a big effort. My staff made a big effort, and plenty of others in the council to one risk assess both kind of environments and the staff working arrangements and, and, and teaching arrangements. Be COVID, be COVID secure, and as I've said before, there is, that that doesn't mean it is absolutely safe. There's one way to make schools really safe is to close them. Um, so there's no risk-free option here. COVID secure does not mean zero risk, um, uh, and to but, but to make those environments as safe as possible. Um, the reality is we've not had um, any real evidence of transmission in schools yet. Un underscore the word in. Um, there have undoubtedly been cases linked to schools, but that's really reflective of the background epidemiology in the community. So a big school with a big take is going to have children who who uh, test positive and become cases. Um, um, there have been no 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 uh, no um, cases of transmission within schools that I'm aware of up to yesterday. Certainly, um, there is a limit to enforcement. Um, we, you know, we can't turn teachers into the police. We're asking teachers to teach, um, and and actually. Um, at academies, we can't tell them what to do. Um, we, we've provided advice as of Department of Education, but we can't tell them what to do. Um, lots of uh, questions in my inbox about masks and why can't we enforce masks um, like anything else. So they, these things are difficult to enforce. Um, th and there is a limit to what can be done by enforcement. Masks aren't the panacea that, that we all want them to be. Um, and it's worth me being clear on that. They, they do matter, they do make a difference. There is no doubt about that. Um, the, the impact of masks is far less significant than hand washing and distance, um, and they're not risk-free. Worn wrongly, masks are worse than useless. And you see plenty of people who wear, who wear masks as a chin strap or don't cover their nose. Um, that makes them worse than, worse than useless. So I think with the, there is something to be done on that one, notwithstanding the enforcement. Um, on, um, um, the risk to children, the, 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 the evidence is mixed at best. The, the consensus of evidence is that children are less badly affected and less likely to become infected. Um, that's, so the, the super spreader phenomenon that's been well described and documented with flu and is in fact the reason why we vaccinate children for flu has not been observed and is, we've tried hard to measure it but it's not yet been observed for, for COVID-19. Um, um, there was a study I became aware of um, earlier today, I think it was Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health sponsored study of, of 100,000 kids that were swabbed, the, the, what one percent of them were positive. Uh, and remember the background positivity for Sheffield certainly is in the order of five, five, four or five percent at the moment. Um, well, I'll post it in the chat if I'm technologically able to. Chief Medical Officer's statement on schools of about three or four weeks ago was exceptionally erudite and the science hasn't shifted on in incredibly since then actually. Um, I did a, a, a brief clip on YouTube summarising some of that and I shall put that on the chat as well if I can find it. Um, and lastly, on um, the parents who feel the risks are unacceptable, only individuals can make that risk assessment. I can't make that remotely. Um, so only parents can make that risk assessment. Um, I will ask education colleagues to get back on the specifics of the, um, the arrangements for lessons online. Um, yes, I think is broadly the answer. Schools will probably also have something to say on that one. Um, and there's a, as I think, as I suspect you'll know, there's a huge amount of DFE um, uh, DFE materials online around curriculum and lesson planning and, and B the BBC stuff has been pretty good as well. Um, but, but education stuff is, is beyond my area of competency, I'm afraid, so I won't comment too much on that one. Um, thank you for that. Um, we have um, got a, a question sort of around generally around uh, enforcement as well. So. Um, I think that would take quite a while to respond to that, but just to say that we are, um, you know, completely and utterly aware of, of the fact that we can't control every single person's behaviour, um, but we will do our very best to persuade um, people um, and convince people that it's not just in their interest, everyone, so that's around communications, which this board talk often about how do we get the messages across in the communication um, in order to keep yourself safe and everyone. Uh, but regarding enforcement of how individuals behave, how individuals behave in school, how, in, how pubs behave, how businesses behave, 
then that's certainly something that we're looking at very closely from the new uh, sanctions that the Prime Minister's uh, brought in regarding fines, etc. Um, you will see that the Council um, uh, submitted some uh, prohibition orders on five, five pubs, I think four pubs and the takeaway, I can't remember, at the weekend. So we do take that enforcement uh, very, very seriously. Um, I'm going to uh, bring a question in from Nicholas about shielding. It's a straightforward uh, question. And then we've got Rhiannon um, and Tony, which is around shielding. So if Nicholas could, Nicholas Wake could join us. I think all three of them are not in the attendees list, Julie. I know Rhiannon had asked for a question to be read out. OK, I'll, I'll read them all out. Generally, they're around what are the current rules for shielding vulnerable persons? Uh, Nicholas wanted to know if he qualified because of his age. He's 82 years old. Uh, Rhiannon is what is the board's current advice for Sheffield residents in the shielding group and what support is available? And Tony's was, it was on the original shielding list uh, due to severe asthma and COPD, but now is expected to go uh, back to work and is self-employed. Um, so I'm going to ask um, Greg to answer the one generally around shielding. Um, and then Louisa, if you just want to mention something about the work you're doing with businesses, because he works for, he's self-employed, but... Um, is 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 struggling regarding this particular his particular work, Greg. Um, thanks, Julie. A few quick few quick reflections on on the question the broad thrust of the questions. So, um, sh shielding was always a strong recommendation to individuals. It was never about mandatory quarantine. You have to lock yourself up. It was always a recommendation to individuals, um, and um, the, the 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 evidence upon which the who's on the shielded list was drawn up when we didn't know as much about the virus as we do now. Um, all of the data we had was from the early studies in China. So we, we basically took a very, very, very precautionary approach to that. Um, and that, that, that was a national approach. We know a lot more now. Um, so the, the net around the how, how you identify who should shield is much more tightly drawn. Um, some work at Oxford University has enabled that to happen, I've and I've not seen the details, but I do know that the number of people that will be recommended to shield is much, much lower than it, it was. Individuals will still need to make their own risk, risk judgments. Um, the policy on shielding was nationally suspended um, um, as we came out of lockdown, um, the national lockdown, other than in areas that are basically in local lockdown, te technically, known as, technically known as areas of interventions. Um, many individuals have chosen to protect themselves, um, and I think that that is, uh, a, uh, that is a, a decision that only they can make. Um, there are harms from shielding, um, lack of social contact, lack of uh, mental well-being, lack of exercise, etc. So there's no doubt about the fact there are harms from shielding. Um, there are all undoubted benefits from shielding. And I can only encourage everyone to look at the intensive care, the intensive care unit admission rate and the mortality rate in some groups of the population. That's why we uh, implemented the national shielding policy. And the balance of those two things was always difficult. Um, so I, I, we may reintroduce shielding in the city that that, that that would probably be done for us if we get to a stage where we get to what's known as in intervention in interventions or government may choose to re-implement shielding policy nationally and i don't know when if and when that may happen so uh, that's a state of where, where we are shielding wise um thank you for that um louisa um will answer just respond to uh give some advice later regarding um self-employment because i know with louise's work what she does uh, around recruitment etc and advice uh, may be able to give a bit of advice to people that are self-employed and um, so louise will respond oh she's there <laughs> thank you 
you have to excuse me because I'm typically multitasking here. I'm actually just picking my children up from school. So if you give me five minutes, I will come back to you with a proper response. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Louise. I did say you would come back uh, Would come back later. We are all multitasking. Shahida's had to leave us, and I know Shafai is uh, going to have to go and do some sort of school run. Uh, school run also uh, at that moment in time. Can we get on to contact uh, tracing? I know I'm skipping through uh, the questions to try and get um, to cover all the sort of different ranges of them rather than just go through uh, the list. So we've got contact tracing, a few questions on that. Is Steve Pagden with us? I'll just bring you in now, Julia. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Steve. Thank you. Uh, You're welcome. Yeah. Firstly, thank you everyone for your varied uh, attention to the problem we're all facing. Uh, it's much appreciated, all the work that everyone's clearly doing. Um, and uh, just another comment. I noticed there's no one really from schools on the board. Just a comment. Am I correct in that? So that's uh, just an observation. But anyway, the question relates to, uh, I dipped into the um, Independent Sage uh, briefing of the 18th of September and Pro Professor Christina Pagel presented uh, a very nice presentation. And essentially that the rate of increase in hospitals and cases is basically exponential, as Greg said, doubling in a period of about eight days. And that, uh, uh, immediate improvement for testing and tracing was essential and she quoted an, an efficiency of 16 percent but if it doubled if that efficiency doubled to 32 percent and was uh, put in place immediately that the apparent um, exponential increase could be halted okay and that has in fact been achieved in Germany Japan and South Korea who flattened their second spikes so the conclusions really that were contact tracing must go local, uh, absence of efficient testing and basing contact tracing upon symptoms rather than test result would improve efficiency and that action must be taken. Have we lost? So, so the questions really- Have we lost are, Steve? We've lost him. Uh, oh, so we have got his question. I don't know if you've got sight of it right now, Greg, but I think you get the gist of it is, is going on about um, basically saying contact tracing must go local. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk about that. Um, I think I Rowan is as... Julie, I could still hear him. Oh, can you? I can't. Well, I'm still here. I'll yes, he's still here. He's just oh, he's okay. still speaking. He's still well, speaking. Sorry, Steve. I'd, I'd, I'd lost you, so carry on. Right, okay. Right, so does Sheffield City Council accept the findings of the SAGE, Independent SAGE report, the 18th of September? And if so, what plans have you got to improve contact tracing within the city? And will the approach be city-led rather than national? Greg? Um, so, I, so I haven't read the Independent Sage report of the 18th of September, but, but the honest answer is I can't read all of the reports that are across my desk. There's quite a lot of them. I'll follow, I'll follow that one up later. As a rule, I do read most of the Independent Sage reports. I definitely read most of the Sage reports, um, but I've not read this particular one. But to answer your question directly, um, 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 the, my, my, my line on contact tracing has been this, been this throughout. Um, um, we have never been in the position where we were able to stand up contact tracing to the required level and the required level of expertise as quickly as was needed. Therefore, test and trace as is currently incepted was always necessary. There's no doubt about that. Um, it is working um, uh, uh, and it, it is, it's, it's working um, moderately well. Um, two, three, three concerns about it. Um, one is the speed of um, getting the speed of time from a symptoms developing to a test result. Second concern is the speed from test results to actually contacts have been uh, cases and contacts being found, followed up and, and uh, given advice. And the third one is about the isolation bit, which you didn't ask, but I'll come on to that. Um, uh, we've never, um, um, we've always said that we will work with NHS test and trace to develop a local model 
um, I think it's fair to say that NHS Test and Trace nationally doesn't seem um, to want to develop a very, very, very local model at a local authority level. It wants to develop a Yorkshire level. Um, I'm, I, I support that. I think we should do that. But we also need a local level. Um, yes, yesterday, I asked my staff to set up a lo lo local model. It will work with NHS Test and Trace. We never wanted to develop something separate to the national system. So the model that we... Um, We'll, we'll have stood up by Tuesday, actually, um, will work with NHS Test and Trace within that system, with Public Health England being the convening factor that brings it all together for Yorkshire. And to be fair to and to their credit, Public Health England have done an amazing job in this space and plenty of other spaces. So, um, we, yes, we are setting up a um, local contact tracing service. It will be set up by... Tuesday, Wednesday, we will get into it slowly because this is not being resourced by NHS Test and Trace. You'll have read the narrative um, about local by defaults. That gives you the impression that the, 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 the swing of um, resources will shift from national to local. NHS Test and Trace is funded to the tune of £12 billion. Um, the totality of the um, government funding for local authority level um, uh, pandemic response, which includes everything, um, oh, well, well more than just just testing, uh, contact tracing, uh, narrowly defined, is about three hundred million pounds. So whatever fraction three hundred million or twelve billion is, that doesn't tell me much, a good story about local by default. Second question is, um, we will not be seeking to do um, contact tracing on the on the basis of symptoms. We will be do, still doing it on the basis of test results, notwithstanding the accessing getting test results problem because if we contact trace on the basis of symptoms an awful lot of contacts will be advised to self-isolate far more so than is actually necessary and that has economic economic and other social impact as well so um, um short out long answer but in short yes we will be we do agree or i do agree with uh, um the independent sage and, and we will have local contact tracing um uh, effective from next week um, can you. I can I just respond, Stephen, to the the question regarding uh, pointing out that there are no sc school representatives on the board? Um, it's just to say that the board, uh, because the board is not a decision making body, uh, it's more a consultative, communications, um, guidance, advice, and prevention and management board. Um, so we can't, as a board, uh, make any decisions regarding a local lockdown or prohibition notices. Or um, So it's not necessarily a rep representative board to make sure you've got all the institutions represented or we'd have NHS here and we'd have uh, people from housing here. And But you have got the council represented with several members of the council and all the community organisation uh, representatives um, some of them are uh, school governors, for example, but certainly they're in, in, in contact on a regular uh, basis um, with a wide range uh, of communities. Um, so regarding um, the advice that we would give to schools, the purpose of the board is, and this is why these sessions are really important because we're hearing from members of the public, what type of worries and concerns they've got, but also what type of information they want us to give out on, um, on a particular issue. So the questions at the next board would be, um, it's been raised that there are certainly some issues and people and some worries about schools, whether it's uh, protecting the staff, protecting the pupils, protecting households when uh, children go back home. But then we'll be thinking about how do we then therefore get that message out? How do we communicate in order to prevent outbreaks or where there might be outbreaks, how we manage that? Um, what type of messaging goes out, how it goes out, who gives it out um, and the manner uh, in which it's, uh, it's produced and uh, prepared. Um, so uh, believe me that that is exactly what this board will be doing. We'll be taking on board your concerns and we'll be making sure that the schools are hearing it and that we help and advise them in order to address address your concerns. Hope that um, answers the question, Stephen, and thank you 
for coming along. If you want to email any further questions, please do so. I've got Louisa back now. So it, it was just generally a question around people that are self-employed, if there's any advice that they can get from somewhere around keeping themselves safe and if they go um, and their own protections really and any support that they can get, Louisa. Yeah, sure. So fr from a chamber perspective, I mean, you can speak to your chamber if you're a member or not, and they'll still give you some advice just in terms of, um, measures you can make to keep yourself at work. Um, I would recommend, I don't know the man's personal situation, but I'd recommend speaking to citizens' advice just with regards to what financial support they might be able to be available to them. And um, they'd be able to advise, obviously, with, with what, what um, their situation is at the moment. Um, now, I don't know the person's, uh, the kind of work that they do and whether they want to look at doing something different that they could do that work from home perhaps that doesn't put them in jeopardy um, and I'd recommend if you go to the Welcome to Sheffield website and go to Invest Sheffield the contact on there is a lady called Anne Brennan she's working with organizations at the moment that are recruiting so if somebody's looking to transfer from a self-employed role that puts them at jeopardy to something working from home that they could do over the phone she'll be aware of some opportunities that might be appropriate. Right thank you for that just to say um Shafak Mohammed's had to leave as well, so he sends his apologies. Um, can we um, do, 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 ask um, Jill Wood? Is Jill Wood here? No, no, Julie, she doesn't appear to be in the, in the list. Okay, um, we've got a lot of general questions. I can say, I can see that there or many sort of specific questions around a certain estate or um, a certain particular uh, building. Um, but I will ask, is uh, Roger Dungworth here? Because he mentions the uh, Crucible Theatre. Is Roger with us? No, again, Julie, he's not, he's not on the attendance list. Um, da, 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 right. Um, Andrew Manas, um, regarding assist, I'm not sure if Andrew's... Paul, Paul May. Paul with us? Hello. Hi, Paul. Hi. I'm just, uh, <laughs> my wife's just rung me, so I'm just going to mute my wife. Oh, dear. Yeah. Yeah. We I'm, can hear her. Tell okay. Her. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's, she's talking around somebody else's garden. Anyway, anyway, right, um, thank you. Uh, so, a little bit of a preamble to start with. Some of what we've heard today illustrates really how important it is to get the message across to all the citizens of Sheffield. What are the messages you've been talking about? In fact, the Chair, you've mentioned this in terms of interpreting national guidelines for our citizens. It's popped up two or three other times as well. So, comms is very important, and I, I, I'm, keen, I'm keen to see lots of types of it. It's my thing at the minute, if you like. Um, so my question is, in an early discussion with, uh, with Greg, he said that the MP and members bulletins from your meetings that go to councils and so on would be in the public domain. If that's right, can they be posted and or made available to residents, perhaps via our councillors or perhaps via some other mode for other people? Can I, first of all, before we try to answer that, Paul, can I ask if you're, um, are you linked to any sort of community organisation or, or, yeah, or, or, or? Okay, I'm, I'm chair of Eggleshaw Forum. I thought I recognised the name. Okay. Um, well, um, ju just on, 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 in response to that, um, the, um, the Ecclesall area will be within a local community response team where all your your local councillors in your particular ward, but local councillors around the um, sort of the, the local area partnership meet on a regular basis, and they do have engagement with their community organisations. So, for example, the one I'm in, we sort of meet quite regularly, in fact, sometimes weekly with all the community organisations. So first of all, I would suggest that you link in with that because you will then get updated regularly. On that particular bulletin, um, we do have a weekly bulletin. It's very comprehensive and extensive. I find it extremely useful myself, even though I am briefed on a daily basis. 
Um, that does go out to all councillors and it goes out to those lo local community response teams for them to brief their community organisations and local councillors in the area. Also goes out to members of parliament and other and others. Um, we did have a discussion this morning, uh, myself, Greg, Dan and um, um, James Anderson, who, who, who is responsible for communications, about whether those bulletins are appropriate to just distribute publicly. Um, we actually concluded that it's not a public document because they are, um, they are composed in a way that it's meant for internal purposes, so all councillors are involved. Um, but we are looking at a way of taking that bulletin and extracting out of it a sort of public facing document that we can put on the website. Um, but also we're saying when all councillors have got access to it, um, they can choose what they do with that information. So I'm going to ask Douglas if he wants to comment on this. Shafak's not here. I would have asked Shafak because he is one of your local councillors. But if Douglas just wants to say a few words about how he uses that bulletin and then we at the next board meeting mm -hmm. we'll think about how we do ensure that the information within that bulletin gets out in a more public facing manner um, that's more helpful to the public. Douglas do you want to um, comment yeah, on that? Certainly I mean it's uh, it's one that is useful for the councillors um, and I can see may well be useful for people in local community organisations uh, to pick up on stuff. I don't think it normally contains anything that's strictly confidential in any way, um, but it's written in such a way that it's, it's, it's not particularly polished, so I'm sure there'll be something in there that could easily be misinterpreted. Um, that happens. Uh, I mean, I think we've had slightly contradictory messages about the extent to which it's confidential. Um, not in a really particularly worrying way. I don't think we've had difficulties in the amongst the community I've been in, involved with about getting the, the right information out where it's requested. Um, but I appreciate that it may not be something that's suitable for putting on the, on the website, even though that would normally be my instinct to do. Um, so, so yeah, I think um, quite a bit of flexibility is needed, really. Um, I, I would have thought that if someone is specifically asking for it, then um, in, in most cases, that should be okay that they would receive it. But yeah, with those caveats, this might be personally. Uh, yeah, no, I appreciate those views because, as I say, I, I do find them to, it, find it extremely comprehensive and yeah. extensive. And as I say, it's particularly written for councillors and MPs, etc. Mm. But I do think there is a way of, of maybe each week mm. looking at it and taking out what might be useful to put in a public bulletin. Just one thing to add there for the public is, I mean, actually now a lot of those bulletins do really contain a lot of links to things that have been put out through the media team. So they are already on the website and it's often quite an index to links on the on the media website. Um, so those could maybe be publicised more widely. Okay, and, and so for the next board meeting, we can talk about the messaging to the wider public and we'll, we'll raise that. Thank you for that. Um, Tony McGettigan um, has posted a question. I think it might have been answered, Tony, but if you want to just quickly pick it up again, just to check. Is Tony with us? I thought it was with us. There we are. Where is it yeah. then? Is there Tony? Hello. Hello, Tony. Do you want to ask you a question? I think it's been answered, but just to check. Yeah, well, really, I've not heard anything myself. I've signed in a bit late today. It's been a bit hectic. Um, yeah. I was on the original shielding list because uh, I've got severe asthma and COPD. Um, however, since the 1st of August, I've been back at work. And as a self-employed gas engineer, I could be entering maybe 15 homes a week easily um, even with masks gloves on and uh, disinfectant wipes personally I don't feel safe in people's houses um, what is actually being done about this I, I believe that the rate or it should be 40 per 100,000 but we was at 48 I think a few days ago per 100,000 um, but we're not in no local lockdown or anywhere near it at the moment 
Yeah, yes, Tony, we did, sorry, um, we did, Louisa from the Chamber did, did try and respond to that in regards that if you are self-employed, there is quite a bit of advice about. Um, um, personally, for, you know, if I, if I knew that you were coming into my house, for example, I would make sure it was safe for you to come in. And I think that's the responsibility of householders. Um, and it's really difficult. Uh, and I, you know, it's not for me to offer advice to you about um, how you go about your own business, but, you know, it is, you, you do need to make sure you are safe and you do need to make sure that when you are going in someone's house that it, it is safe. And I think it's perfectly acceptable to ask them what they've done to make it safe for you. Um, I know that doesn't help because it's your livelihood and we did talk earlier on about, you know, we are saving lives, but we're also conscious of livelihoods because we know um, the loss of livelihoods can lead to um, uh, harm to people and their families. Um, so um, we will try and send you some advice around uh, because we do it for our own workforce, for our council houses. So I'll have a think about what advice we give to our own workforce that go out and do gas fitting in council houses. And we'll try and give you, uh, send you some advice um, of that nature, if that's okay, Tony. Um, and deal with it on a one-to-one -one personal uh, request. My is that problem okay? is, is, my problem is, is when people want jobs done, they're not always necessarily honest. Um, I actually entered a house yesterday um, and then actually found out um, after I've been at the property that the decorator has possibly had COVID previous. Can I can I just say to you, I really thank you for your questions because this is the why this this is why this session is really useful being public because uh, members of the public out there are listening to genuine concerns about people that are trying to go about their daily lives and business. And it, in effect, it's a plea to people that if you, like I've said, if you are inviting people into your home for whatever reason, whether it's just visiting or to do work, then you have a responsibility to those visitors into your home, and especially if they're doing work. And what we'll do is think about the messaging that we might give out to household regarding that. And I think that's something definitely we can pick up mm. around messaging to every household in Sheffield, that if you are inviting people into your house, please be mindful you have some responsibility to them. Mm. But having said that, I will also try and think about some personal advice we can give to you and guidance that we mm. give to our own workforce for you to be able to make sure that you're safe and we will do that. So yes. thank you very much, Tony, coming along. I think it's uh, it's always good to hear from sort of these heartfelt concerns and worries that people have because mm. it just shows how serious it is. Um, Greg. Just to add, we, uh, as Julie alluded to, we've done an, a huge amount of work for our own staff, many of whom are in a similar position, Tony. So um, and that, that it, I mean, it, it's, it's done, it's freely available, and it's how, how to risk assess these kinds of scenarios, what kind of personal protective equipment you do or don't need. Um, so we, we, we can make that freely available to anyone who wants it, actually. I don't quite know how we'll do that, but, but it, the work is done. It's rel relatively easy to get out there. Yeah, well, we'll send we'll send it direct to Tony, and then we'll think about how we can spread the message a bit a bit wider. Douglas, well, I just wanted to, to add to that because in terms of gas fitting, and it's a it's a really good example, Tony, of um, you know the interface you've got with other people because obviously you've got worries, and they may also be worries because of course in the way that you don't know about them, they don't know about you before you yeah. get there. Um, I do know that for gas fitters, the health and safety executive had some fairly detailed advice on um, what you to expect of you and what's expected of the places you visit. Uh, I know I looked at it earlier on in the lockdown uh, around about April, um, but I, I guess it'll still be there. And, and that's something that, you know, probably everyone in your situation should be aware of. And then, of course, there's difficulty about being self-employed. And I, I don't know about your personal position. Obviously, the, the government's view is that if you're self-employed, there are the, um, the, the schemes to help people who can't work because of things like this, because of it being self-employed. But if in reality, self-employed is a label for um, where you don't have so much choice over your work, that's, that's a different issue altogether. Appreciate that. Thank you. Right. 
thank you, Tony. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to bring in one final question because we do have to go because it is really quite relevant from the uh, launch yesterday, let's say. There was a question about the new app um, and, uh, and generally about local lockdown. So, Greg, could you just say a few words about the new app and then um, how we, Sheffield, would respond we, where, where, when and how we consider a local lockdown? Um, the, 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 the app, and I genuinely can't say a great deal. I, I've, not, I've not actually left the house this week, so I've, not, I've downloaded it on my phone. I've not yet worked out how to use it per, you know, pers personally. So um, uh, I'm, 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 going out, I'm going out later this evening, so I might, I might work out to use it then. Um, but, but basically, I think um, we're, we're encouraging as many people who's, who feel inclined to, to download it. The more people that download it and have it activated, the quicker the uh, contact tracing process can work. Um, there is functionality on there. And as I say, I've not used it personally, so I, don't, I can't give you a, a how to use it. Um, but there's functionality on the app to scan in and out of premises. And we're asking premises to display the QR code so that people can scan in and out really quickly as opposed to having to fill in your mobile phone details and all that kind of stuff. The, the, uh, the scanning in and out of premises enables the app or your phone to know where you've been and we will all forget where we've been two weeks ago so um um but the the practicalities i i <laughs> embarrassed to say i honestly can't tell you i've not done it personally um so um uh, at least i'm being honest with you the second point about local um lockdown a term i hate i hate the term lockdown um, um it's basically shorthand for intensifying efforts and interventions um the, the the thing that everyone focuses on is sort of closing stuff down we have been there before we did that in march um, and it did a lot of economic and social harm and we don't want to go back there nobody thinks that's a sensible idea it's a blunt tool it definitely achieved the job um, um in terms of virus suppression but the virus will come back as we are seeing now to our cost um so what what we are doing is intensifying our efforts um across all of the areas of our plan which um, don't yet include um, measures to force people to, uh, you know, force people into restrictive measures that change what they can and can't do and to close premises down, but, or other than obvious examples that have flouted the law. Uh, Julie mentioned the prohibition notices with sort of flagrant flouting of the law, basically. And to, to be fair, most licensed premises have worked exceptionally hard um, on, um, and, you know, Putting in place the putting in place the requirements of the law, so I, I, it's it's always possible that um, she, um, Sheffield may may have a lockdown imposed upon it by government. Um, that is a government call, not our call. And government's been very clear; they're prepared to do that. They've done it in lots of places. Um, it, it's it, there's a there's a, a the, the focus of our energies and efforts is around. Um, achieving behavior change across the whole population um rather than trying to force force change via the law at the moment um the rates of infection are a long way from anything that might be considered lockdown um my only caveat on that is you've seen how quickly this grows so that that this changes week by week sometimes hour by hour um so it can make no guarantees that sheffield will never be in lockdown but all of us are trying very very hard to avoid that Right, and, and then just to, to finally add on the uh, app one, um, that I think that's something we'll discuss at the board next week, because if, if, if we are going to encourage people to download the app, we also have to be mindful that not everyone is able to do that for various reasons. Either they don't have smartphones or they're not technological like I'm not, or for lots of other different reasons, concerns um, uh, about um, giving data, personal data, and all those sorts of different things. And that's why this board is made up as it is, as it is, because we believe that every sector is represented on this board. And when we discuss that about how do we encourage people to use the app, everyone on this board will have um, a sort of uh, contributions to make about how do we reach their relevant organizations communities um and i know joe and susan will probably have absolutely no problem 
uh, in uh, university students, etc., being able to download an app. I think they live by them, don't they? And young people. But I certainly know Emily's community, because as I say, my, my son won't download this app. Um, and other other older people like my mum and dad certainly won't. So the, this representative board to reach out to communities, there will be some that will find it easier within their community to do something and reach out to them and some we won't. So if we discuss it next week, we'll think about, so therefore how do we reach all sectors of our uh, uh, city and every single uh, community? And that's one main reason. Uh, for this uh, for this board. So thank you very much to all uh, panellists. Um, thank you very much to uh, members of the public that have brought those questions. As I say, every single one of them um, is extremely valid because we take them forward to the next discussion because we know what concerns, worries, questions you're raising um, and uh, how we then continue to address them and also communicate them. Um, so please tune in next time. It'll pro probably be a month away. Um, and, um, and we look forward to uh, seeing you all again. Um, so thank you very much. And thanks to Dan. And all have a nice, uh, nice weekend. Thanks, Julie. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.